Good morning, everybody. I hope you can hear me and you can see the welcome screen. If it's correct, just give me a, a short feedback, please. Yes, we can see it. Okay, okay, that's great. So today we talk about cardiovascular system and uh, this, I, I hope you will find this very useful because blood vessels, they are in, in all organs of the human body. And we could say without exaggerating that the health status and the condition of our tissues and organs strongly depends on the quality of the uh, blood uh, supply. So we go to the, to the start, new topic. Uh, I have prepared a few sketches uh, to explain the, the basic concepts and then we will have a more closer look on the, uh, on the real slides. So if we talk about cardiovascular system, what do we have on our mi mind? It's the heart with its three anatom anatomical layers. It's the blood vessels. And also the lymph vessels and organ could be part of it, but we will talk about it in an extra class next week. Uh, the blood vessels are uh, arteries, uh, our veins, and in between we have uh, vessels uh, called microcirculation that connects the arteries with the veins. Arteries are the blood vessels that are carrying the blood from the heart. Veins are carrying the blood towards the heart. From histological point of view, we will distinguish uh, arteries that are so-called conducting type. Uh, that uh, means uh, they have lots of elastin. These are the largest arteries of the human body. The aorta, its major branches, and the pulmonary trunk. The majority of uh, uh, arteries in the human body and the majority of arteries you know by names uh, from anatomy are muscular arteries. These are all the medium and small sized arteries. They, carry, they are responsible for distributing uh, the blood. Then, we, then they branch into arterioles that usually don't have anatomical names anymore, but they uh, have um, a quite an impressive muscular layer in relation to the diameter of the lumen. That means they can, they can um, dilate or constrict uh, in a very efficient way, therefore being responsible for the total resistance uh, uh, of the arterial system, which uh, regulates the blood pressure, because the blood pressure generated by the heart needs to overcome this resistance to make the blood flow. Then we enter the microcirculation where the uh, histological uh, uh, structure of the wall is already so thin that it uh, permits some exchange of metabolites across this wall. We have uh, arteries that come after, which is Greek in Greek, meta, okay? after arterioles, so it's met arterioles. Then we have capillaries, three types. Uh, with different permeability, and we got post-capillary venules. We already entered the venous systems with venules and veins. Uh, you will uh, talk about this in much more detail in uh, second year physiology classes, but this is just for the first look. Let's think about how much blood does the human heart of an adult person pump every minute. It's approximately five liters, that's called the cardiac output. And think about the proportion of the oxygen consumption that needs to be delivered into various compartments of the human body. So if you start with brain, you can see it takes like 13% of the cardiac output, but more than a fifth of the total oxygen consumption. That's interesting, right? It's also why it's the first uh, organ that gives up during the hypoxia six, seven, eight seconds of hypoxia and the, uh, or, or uh, stopping the perfusion of, of, the, of the brain and we are starting to lose consciousness because our brain cortex is extremely sensitive to, to, to insufficient uh, blood and oxygen supply. The GIT, including liver, takes approximately one-fourth of the cardiac output and the oxygen consumption uh, and the skeletal muscles, of course, this is like in the resting condition and depends on the consistency of, of, and of, the, of the body, but roughly it's one-fifth. Uh, the kidneys, 
they take one fifth of the cardiac output. So one, approximately one liter per minute. These are highly perfused organs, although taking less oxygen that will be proportional because they are filtering the blood, okay? And skin as the largest organ plus the other organs take the rest. However, the majority of the blood in every moment is in a low pressure capacity system, which includes the microcirculation, the venous part of microcirculation and the venous system. So that's where the majority of your blood is in every moment. Uh, uh, it, it flows slowly because there's low pressure. To explain the histology of the arterial and uh, venous wall, I need to make some comments on the relation between the proportions of the thickness of the vascular wall, the diameter, and the blood pressure. So on the x-axis, we got we put we put these uh, uh, blood vessels uh, in the same direction as the bloodstream flows. So we're starting with the aorta, arteries, arterial capillaries, venules, veins, and the vena cava, which returns the blood to the heart. And this is the lumen. And this is the wall thickness. So we can see the largest arteries have considerably large lumen, large diameter, but well, two millimeters wall. So they are not efficient in things like constriction, constriction or dilation. These are uh, conducting, uh, sorry, these are arteries that are resisting the, the systolic um, blood pressure peaks uh, released into these major arteries during the systolic phase of cardiac cycle. If you go to arteries, normal like muscular arteries, think about, I don't know, femoral artery, okay, or tibial artery. Um, it has a uh, more narrow lumen, but the proportion of the wall thickness to the lumen is uh, now larger. And in the arterioles, uh, I put only the, 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 the middle values here, the mean values, uh, they have a uh, thickness of the wall comparable to the lumen, so they can very effectively uh, constrict or dilate, thus regulating the blood pressure. And here is what happens with the mean blood pressure in these individual parts of the circulation. It drops and it becomes very low on the, on the level of microcirculation and especially the veins. It could be even slightly negative in some veins above the, the heart level. Uh, the veins are uh, usually, uh, they have large, diame large diameter, but very thin wall, and they have few muscle uh, cells. Uh, this is an analogy of the Ohm's law, you know, from the physics or electricity. But if we think about this resistance as the systemic vascular resistance, and the, 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 the voltage would be replaced by the pressure across the circulation, which is the difference between the arterial and venous pressure. And think, think about blood as a fluid moving according to the pressure gradient, okay? It flows where the pressure gradient uh, 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 is directing to. And the, flow, the, the current is here being replaced in this analogy by the flow through the vasculature, which is actually the cardiac output, so you can take this equation and express something that is in medicine called mean arterial pressure, which is a very good uh, estimate of the, of the quality of perfusion of the human organs. And it's, it's used in medicine widely. But you would need the mean venous pressure for, for being able to calculate that, and that would be an invasive, um, you, ca you can't get it with, without making, uh, putting an invasive sun inside the human body. And that's why we use an approximative formula, which is the diastolic pressure plus one third of the difference between the systolic and diastolic pressure. So if you have this uh, systolic pressure of 120 and diastolic pressure of 80 millimeters of mercury, you can calculate that the, your mean arterial pressure would be approximately 93 millimeters of mercury. And that corresponds to the optimum qu quality of perfusion of the human organs. You will hear about that in much more details in, histo in physiology, but uh, I will uh, uh, call your attention to, to this point once explaining the difference in the histology of muscular versus elastic arteries. But first, uh, let's revise the heart wall. Uh, 
the heart has three layers, epicardium, myocardium, and in, in, inside deeply there is endocardium. The surface of the heart is glossy because it's, it's, it's covered by a simple squamous epithelium called mesothelium, which is supported by a thin layer of submosothelial connective tissue. Together, we always call this serosa, and it's like the same serosa or similar serosa like uh, that lines the, the abdominal cavity or the pleural cavity, right? Um, then the part of the epicardium uh, uh, is uh, adipose tissue, variable amounts of fat, and the major, major coronary blood vessels, artery, coronary arteries and coronary veins. You can find also autonomic nerves there. Uh, they are not necessary uh, for the, uh, uh, for the uh, cardiac function because the, the electric impulses are generated uh, inside the heart in special cardiac myocytes that are part of the, car of the uh, cardiac conductive system. But these autonomic nerves, which could be sympathetic um, uh, uh, or parasympathetic nerves, are somehow affecting the heart rate, the, 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 the contractility, the, 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 the power of the, of the contraction, etc. Uh, then we come to the thickest uh, wall of the heart, which is the myocardium. You already know it from the from the lesson about the muscle tissue. So it's made of cardiac myocytes that are striated sarcomeric muscle cells with one or exceptionally two cell nuclei in the center that are connected via the intercalated discs. They are surrounded by a connective tissue called called endomysium that contains a dense network of capillaries. Uh, it has a variable thickness, so I, I, I left it out. And if you will be looking on the, on the myocardium of, uh, of uh, heart ventricles, then uh, you would find uh, uh, just below the, the, the subendothelial connective tissue, somehow larger uh, muscle uh, cardiac muscle cells called purkinje fibers. Uh, so they are already uh, on, the, on the border between the myocardium and endocardium. Endocardium is made of the endothelium that lines the in, in inner spaces of the heart uh, chambers. And the, it's underlined by some subendothelial connective tissue. One note to the atrial cardiac myocytes, some of them have endocrine function they are able to produce atrial natriuretic peptide as a response to to being stretched too much when there's too much uh, venous return that comes back to the to, into the heart it dilates the atria and the cardiac myocytes are responding by producing a hormone that that prevents reabs reabsorption of sodium and water in kidney therefore more uh, more sodium and water is uh, uh, be becomes part of the definitive urine, which which um, which uh, and this increased diuresis or formation of urine uh, decreases the volume of the circulation of the circulating fluid, which is called volemia. So it's like a, a negative feedback mechanism that prevents uh, overloading of the heart in some limits. So think about cardiac myocytes, not only as contractile cells, but also pr pr producing action potentials and some even producing hormones. Now the difference between elastic versus muscular arteries. What do they have in common is this three-layered structure, tunica intima, the innermost layer, tunica media, the middle layer, and tunica adventitia or externa, the outermost layer. It's the same. Uh, but the proportions of the uh, layers uh, are different. Uh, we start with the tunica intima, which is made of endothelium, one layer of flat cells, and the basal lamina and the subendothelial connective tissue, which normally is very thin. Then comes the media. The media starts with the first layer of uh, uh, elastic membranes or elastic lamina, which is called the internal elastic lamina. In elastic arteries, the whole media contains many layers of um, uh, these uh, elastic 
membranes, which are two-dimensional structures with hole inside. So on, on a section, you, you, you see it as fibers that are interconnected with some branches of elastin. But in reality, it's, it's a sheet uh, with, uh, with, uh, with openings through which the smooth muscle cells are penetrating or collagen fibers or glycos, aminoglycans are penetrating. And we got in elastic arteries this typical, I would say, sandwich-like structure where you have elastic membrane, collagen, a smooth muscle cell, collagen, elastin. And this unit is repeating many times in the wall of the aorta. That makes the elastic arteries literally elastic. And it's the, one of the differences uh, uh, in comparison with muscular arteries, with the medium and small size arteries, where the elastin is limited only to the internal elastic lamina and possibly also to the last membrane, which is called external elastic lamina. But the media uh, does not have this repeating pattern of elastic membranes, but it's mostly filled with smooth muscle cells. Okay? Uh, the Adventitia is then similar. It contains type 1 collagen, thicker bundles, and tiny blood vessels that are responsible for providing nutrition from outside, providing nutrition of the vascular wall itself. So uh, we call it Vesa Vesorum, which, if you translate it from Latin, means blood vessels of the blood vessels. Similarly, there are autonomous nerves uh, either uh, supplying these smooth muscle cells inside the tunica media or propagating along these uh, arteries somewhere into the periphery, which is a typical pattern of sympathetic uh, nerves. They, 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 they propagate to the periphery along the, uh, the, the arteries in the adventitia of the accompanying arteries. So that's the adventitia. And now think about uh, the red and blue curve. It shows you how much uh, is there a pressure difference between the systolic versus diastolic blood, blood pressure in time during one cardiac cycle. And the red, red, uh, red curve shows you the situation the elastic arteries are exposed to. Because during systole, there is, a, there is a pressure peak. Heart pumps the blood in the aorta. In the diastole, there is a pre large pressure drop because heart is pumping nothing. So we got a great pressure difference or pressure amplitude. And that's why elastic arteries are necessary need the elastin to withstand these uh, periodic loading, which takes literally... Um, your whole life. Without elastin, without this ability to accumulate this, uh, this energy and return it back into the, during the diastole, uh, the aorta would not be able to withstand this cyclic loading. While in the more peripheral arteries, in the muscular arteries, the difference between the systolic and diastolic pressure is already smaller because it has been like buffered by the previous elasticity of the of the arteries. Then we entering um, microcirculation because arteries are branching into arterioles um, that have, they can have two, four, six layers of smooth muscle cells. So they are very efficient in uh, vasoconstriction or vasodilation because we, uh, we have thousands and thousands of arterioles in human body. The, the overall uh, number is really large. Together, they are they are really uh, essential for for essentially affecting the blood pressure, right? The uh, the they are branching into met arterioles, uh, and these met arterioles before they split into capillaries, uh, they have uh, these sphincters, which is like um, a thickening of the spiral a spiral. Uh, uh, spiral uh, smooth muscle cells. Uh, there is an arterial part of the capillaries, a venous part, and the venous outflow via the postcapillary venules that enter the venules that merge into veins. In most organs of the human body, there are also potential 
shortcuts or bypasses or shunts. That means there is a optional communication between arterioles and venules without splitting into the capillary network. Again, this is regulated by smooth muscle sphincters and it, this uh, gives the, the option to redistribute uh, the blood into these organs where it's really needed. Everyone knows the situation where we are under the tone of sympathetic nerve fibers. Uh, we, we can see our skin becomes pale because the, 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 the sphincters uh, uh, that are uh, these sphincters are closing the most of the capillaries of the skin. Therefore, more blood can be pumped into our muscles, for example. Okay, and conversely, um, after having a good lunch, the precapillary sphincters in the splen splenic microcirculation in in the, in the in intestines will relax letting more flow, blood flow to flow in, and then less blood remains for the other organs. So these are the two examples everybody knows from, from everyday life. It's of course much more complex, but you need to remember that the overall capacity of the microcirculation, yeah, if all the sphincters would relax at once, we would literally bleed out into our own microcirculation because there will be a huge drop of the blood pressure not providing enough pressure for perfusing the vital organs such as brain heart kidney etc and unfortunately you will face this situation in intensive care units uh, in, in in some se severe medical conditions so you need definitely to know about the uh, these sphincters that are regulating the redistribution of the blood on the level of uh, microcirculation. Speaking about microcirculation, let's uh, discuss the three types of capillaries that occur in the human body. I start with uh, the one that is the that has the um, lowest permeability. Uh, this is due to uh, the endothelial cells that are closely connected with each other via tight junctions that are preventing any molecules to 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 pass uh, uh, between the cells and second there is a continuous basal lamina surrounding the the this endothelium we call this capillaries of continuous type and where do they occur in lung as part of the blood air barrier I hope you remember these continuous capillaries also from the central nervous system because they are part of the blood-brain barrier. Okay, they are also in muscles and in exocrine glands. Another, another type uh, is different because it contains small pores, small openings uh, that allow some molecules to pass through uh, these gaps uh, and openings in the endothelial cells. Also the uh, the uh, the uh, basal lamina is, has small openings. We call this openings in the endothelium fenestrations from, from the Latin word for window, which is fenestra. So these are fenestrated capillaries that are more permeable. You can find this in kidney as part of the uh, kidney glomeruli. You can find this in, 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 in intestines choroid plexus endocrine glands. Uh, the third type is, has uh, the most permeability because there are huge gaps, much larger among the, uh, than the fenestrations here. And also the uh, basal lamina is only made of fragments. Very often these uh, are dilated, dilated uh, capillaries called blood sinusoids. You can compare the art could be two or three times of large diameter than the continuous type capillaries. They occur in the bone marrow, liver, let's respite pulp, where even the transport of whole cells is greatly facilitated through these, through these widely opened spaces. The microcirculation takes us into venous system. So the histology of vein, uh, 
What makes it different from the arteries? Well, it also has intima media and adventitia, but the proportions are completely different. The major uh, layer of uh, the venous wall is usually the adventitia. There is less uh, smooth muscle, okay? The smooth muscle does not occur in media only, like in arteries, but also in adventitia. And some veins even have longitudinal smooth muscle, which never happens in arteries. In arteries, the smooth muscle is um, arranged like in spirals. In, in, in veins, it's sometimes uh, longitudinal smooth muscle bundles running parallel to the long axis of the, of the, of the vein. Uh, especially in muscular veins, such as the saphena magna, saphena parva. And uh, in the endotitia, there are nervi and vasa visorum. One remark to the intima, it makes these, uh, these uh, valves, which is like a fold, uh, a fold uh, 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 of the intima. I... I see some questions in the in the chat. I will go to that at the, at the end of our session. Okay, I will not forget that. Uh, so these are venous valves that are preventing the reflux of the blood. All these schemes are on our channel on the YouTube with all the additional comments. So you can go it in detail if, if you want. Uh, these are a few schemes. So all the students are supposed to to understand the, the anatomic and histological difference between arteries and veins, uh, the changes in proportions I just gave my comments on, uh, and uh, uh, now some real pictures. I'll start with the heart. Uh, now from right to the left, there is the epicardium, myocardium being the thickest layer, and the endocardium on the left. Uh, here is uh, another picture. The epicardium is now on, on the left, showing you the adipose tissue. Okay, it's it's in the ventricular wall. The adipose tissue very often surrounds the branches of coronary arteries and coronary veins. This is one of the peripheral nerves. We cannot say whether it's a sympathetic or parasympathetic nerves. You know, there are parasympathetic branches of the vagus nerve here, and there are sympathetic cardiac nerves. So we would need to prove what, what um, a neurotransmitter would be inside to tell whether it's sympathetic or parasympathetic. And here already starts the myocardium. Um, this is a detail of myocardium and endocardium showing the inner aspect of the ventricular wall. And again, uh, in some parts of the arteries, the endocardium is very thick. And here inside, there will be endothelium. Okay, you can see the, the flat cell or the flat nucleus of, of the endothelial cell lining the inner surface of the heart, uh, atria, and ventricles. Uh, from anatomy classes, you, in anatomy classes, you heard about the cardiac skeleton. This involves uh, a dense uh, collagenous connective tissue. Uh, that uh, uh, helps to anchor and anchor the 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 of the of the of the cause of the valves, and this is one of the valves. You can see is actually part of the endocardium that makes this this uh, this cusp one of the cusp of the valve. It looks fragile, but actually, it's it's a uh, it's a uh, uh, it's, uh, it's a tissue surrounded by endothelium on the surface. Endothelium prevents uh, the coagulation of blood, among other functions. Then you have the black is elastin. So that's why any uh, metabolic disorders affecting the elastin synthesis also are causing um, uh, insufficiency of heart valves, for example. And inside you have the collagen. So these, these are the uh, leaflets or cusps of the heart valves attached to the cardiac skeleton. And we go to the major arteries. This is the aorta, the proportion between the intima, media, 
and Adventitia. Here you can see the Vesa Vesorum in Adventitia. This is a young infant, this is an infant, and this is an adult. So you can see that as we age, our body grows, the arteries also are growing, and the dif there's a difference not only in thickening of the intima, which, uh, which is a part of the aging uh, that affects our arteries, but how much thicker the media is, because we have much more these lamellar units with the sandwich arrangement of elastin, collagen, smooth muscle, and so on. So in this adult individual, we want one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 20, 30, 40, I don't know, 45 lamellar units. This is a typical elastic artery, okay? And here the electron micrograph sh shows you really this sandwich-like structure where between the white elastin substance, we got the smooth muscle cells and the collagen. And again, this pattern repeats again and again. These smooth muscle cells are produ actually producers of the elastin and the collagen inside the the arterial walls. So don't think about smooth muscles as only about contractile cells, but also they are producers of the extracellular matrix in the vascular wall. Uh, just compare with what we have just uh, seen uh, in arteries with veins. This is the inferior vena cava, the largest uh, vein of the human body together with the superior vena cava. You can see that uh, the major or the thickest layer is the adventitia. And there is even no, no precisely defined anatomical border separating the media from the adventitia, like we had in the arteries. Yeah? Uh, there is much more collagen, less smooth muscle, and much more collagen okay? in, 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 in this large vein when compared to the arteries. And we come to the smaller muscular arteries. Uh, here you can see the intima, you can see the, 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 end, the, the nuclei of the endothelial cells uh, as prominences in, into the lumen. Uh, you can see the first elastic membrane or first elastic lamina here, that's the way we structure that separates the intima from the media. The media contains, I don't know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, perhaps nine, uh, concentric layers of smooth muscle cells. So there is a great potential for constriction or dilation, um, which regulates the blood pressure and the adventitia here, uh, okay? The first and the last elastic lamina, they have special name, like the internal elastic lamina on the border between intima and media, and last one between the media and adventitia. This is the internal elastic lamina and the external elastic lamina. And although you can see some traces of elastin, these are the, um, these wavy membranes in the media, it's already a muscular artery, okay? We have also muscular veins, especially the veins of the lower extremities, such as the saphena magna or saphena parva, or the greater and lesser saphenous veins uh, that are carrying the blood against the gravity. They are pretty muscular as well. And again, the, uh, the, the thickest layer is adventitia here, and there's much more collagen. That's why some collagen insufficiency also affects blood vessel blood, blood vessels on, of all levels. So think about, you, you remember the, the, the problem with scurvy we discussed a week ago, right? Okay, uh, some blood vessels are really special, such as coronary vessels. Uh, this, is, uh, this shows you one of the major branches of, 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 of coronary arteries. They are pretty much elastic. The black, the black fibers here is elastin. But technically, they are muscular arteries, but still with uh, with a, with um, with a sufficient presence of elastin, not in media, but here is the internal elastic membrane and the external elastic membrane, very well defined. Uh, this the histological structure of elastic, uh, oh sorry, of coronary arteries is reflected also by the fact that when you need to replace these arteries during the 
uh, uh, during the uh, coronary artery bypass surgery, uh, you, you need to pick some arteries from the human body as autologous grafts uh, used for reconstruction that, have, that share some histological similarities with the coronary arteries. And at the same time, uh, this, uh, this, uh, last, these arteries you need to take grafts from to use it for coronary bypass grafts need to be, uh, uh, they, they don't need to be vital so, you, so the patient could, could, uh, could uh, sustain, uh, suffer the removal of these arteries. So the arteries of first choice in most patients would be radial artery and the, and the uh, internal mammary artery. They have a very similar histologic structure, and these are arteries of the first choice for, revascul for uh, cardiac surgery, because they resemble the histological structure of coronary arteries. Here, the, uh, yes, the, the, the elastin here is stained black. I see one of the question. Uh, it's in... Uh, it's in some um, special staining uh, methods. This is, for, for example, a combination of fungism method that stains the uh, muscle and the collagen and special for half hematoxylin that stains the elastin black. So, you know, in histology, we use a combination of various staining methods according to what do we want to see. We use that or that or that staining. So we have a whole palette of stainings uh, so we need to be familiar with, with it. I will then show you more pictures showing the, how elastin stains in hematoxin, eosin, et etc. Et but now you can see the, the, the surface of the elastic membranes and you can see the, this, there's the green stuff here on this scheme as a really a two-dimensional structure with some holes inside. So don't think about it as fibers only. It's a sheet. It's a two-dimensional sheet. We are approaching the arterioles. This arteriole uh, shows a prominent nuclei of endothelial cells and one, two, yeah, two layers of smooth muscle cells that are capable of, of constriction or dilation. Uh, again, this is an electron micrograph showing you the smooth muscle cells and the endothelial cells and the red blood cells inside. Okay, so these arterioles. This is a, a comparison of an arteriole. Here is the lumen of arteriole with endothelium cell and possibly one, two, three, four layers of smooth muscle compared to a lumen of a small vein, a venule, where we have only endothelium cells and usually no smooth muscle cells. So compare a venule with an arteriole. Arterioles are muscular, venules are not. Again, uh, this is uh, to show the, the interior uh, of an endothelial cell with some vesicles. I, I hope you can see this. There's a vesicle forming right now. And this points to one of the functions of the endothelium, this to transport um, vesicles from the blood to the deeper, deeper uh, uh, aspects of the vascular wall. We call it transcytosis. And so there is a formation of the vesicles that are transported across the endothelium and released on the other side. In this case, it's the, it's the only choice because uh, here the endothelial cells are sealed with tight junctions. Uh, so the endothelium cells are deciding which substances will be, will be transported and which will be not. So there's a highly selective function of endothelium. Moreover, don't think about endothelium uh, as only a lining of the blood vessels that prevents uh, uh, blood coagulation or formation of thrombus. Think about it as also uh, cells that are affecting the homeostasis of the arterioles, venules, and arteries and veins, because the endothelial cells can produce many substances that are causing constriction or they are relaxing the, the, the blood vessels. The major constrictors uh, could be, for example, molecules called endothelins, endothelins. And the relaxing factors is, uh, for example, there are many 
the most famous is the endothelial de derived relaxing factor, which is nothing else than a molecule as the nitric, uh, called the nitric monoxide. And the nitric monoxide is a highly potent dilator of smooth muscle cells, and the smooth muscle cells are, are responding with relaxing, which needs, which results into dilation of, of the blood vessel. So if you heard, ever heard about nitroglycerin as, the, as a drug causing relaxing of mo most smooth muscle cells, that's just mimicking a normal, one of the normal uh, transmitter molecules, the nitric monoxide released by the endothelial cells. So endothelial cells are also target of many substances in, in medicine, in pharmacology, you'll hear about it later, definitely. In the real uh, slides that uh, the first students are supposed to, to, to understand under the microscope, you will very often find blood vessels. Nearly in every organ, um, you will find blood vessels. In every tissue, except for example, epithelia that are avascular, and uh, the mature cartilage, which, which also is avascular, that means it has no blood vessels. With these, without the, or beside the, these exceptions, you will find blood vessels everywhere. So literally, you need to understand um, and diagnose the blood vessels in, in your slide. It would make no sense to avoid the blood vessels. Uh, so uh, everyone should be able to tell an arterial from a venule. This is a nice example. I hope you will never forget this once you see this side-by-side -side comparison. The arterioles are usually round-shaped because they have muscle cells, smooth muscle cells in the wall with, that helps them to maintain the shape even after death. When the blood pressure drops, the artery, arteries and arterioles have a tendency to retain the shape they, they, they got in vivo. Perhaps they constrict a bit, but they still have a more round profile on the section. Unlike the venule, the venule is, uh, this venule is a pretty large. It, it even has a larger diameter than the accompanying arteriole. And that makes sense because we know, already know that the venules and veins are part of the low pressure compartment of our circulation. So if the blood flows, and, uh, under the low pressure, it flows slowly. And therefore, if you remember the equation of the continuity equation from physics, it needs more space to flow through. It's the capacity part of the circulation. So the venules have large diameter. From histological point of view, they are made mostly of endothelium. And this particular venule has no smooth muscle cells around it. So everybody can see the comparison to an arterial, right? Sometimes, if you're lucky, you can find in the venules also these valves. These are two leaflets of, of, a, of a valve. So you might be pretty sure that this is a venule. This one contains one, two, I believe, two layers of smooth muscle cells, but it is valve, so it's a venule. Uh, this is again the endothelium here sealed and uh, compared uh, with the with red blood cells and blood platelets um, in the lumen of the of the arteriole, and this is a nice picture showing the complexity of endothelial cells. They have rough endoplasmic reticulum. They have Golgi complex. You can see the vesicular transport here. The vesicles part of the transcytosis, you can see the nucleus. So uh, we have a, a co considerable population of endothelial cells in human body, several hundreds of grams of highly active cells that could be damaged, that could decide about uh, progression of many diseases, uh, leading of which would be the atherosclerosis you will definitely hear about later on. So from histology, remember these features of endothelial cells. Sorry. Uh, now the capillaries, this is a longitudinal section through a capillary uh, showing you the prominent endothelial cells. Uh, capillaries usually don't have, they don't have mu uh, smooth muscle cells anymore. Uh, sometimes you can find some additional cells here, but these are mostly cells called pericytes. Pericytes 
have a regulatory function, some of these are contractile, some of these are affecting the microcirculation. And this is a cross-section of capillaries in the, in the skeletal muscle. So if you will describe skeletal muscle for your you know, credit exam, from now on, don't forget also to describe the endomysium, this connective tissue here, that contains a dense capillary network. Yeah? You can see the cross-section of the capillaries. This is a, a, a nucleus of endothelial cell. That's it. How do we know it's skeletal muscle? We know it because it's made of fibers that possess more nuclei located here on the, on the periphery. That's typical. And again, electron micrograph uh, of the uh, of some capillaries, uh, showing you the. Uh, we start with the uh, less permeable uh, capillaries called continuous capillaries. This is a capillary from uh, from central nervous system, so you can see the tight junctions here, leaving no space for some paracellular transport. So everything needs to go across the endothelium, where the endothelium decides what should be transposed. Trans, uh, transport it or not. Then we have the continuous basal lamina, as this, and we have the processes of astrocytes, so that's part of the blood-brain barrier. The continuous uh, capillaries are also in the skeletal muscles. This is a proof. These are the fenestrated capillaries, for example, in, in, in the endocrine organs or in the, in the kidney. You can see these tiny openings. These are the fenestrations. Right? So there's a fenestrated endothelium, fenestrated capillary. And this is even a scanning electron microscope that shows you not the section like this, but like the transmission electron microscope, but the, the, the surface view. So you can have the idea about uh, the, the arrangement of these fenestration, fenestrations. Okay? Again, these fenestrations here. So there is much, the, the, the transport of larger molecules is much more feasible through these fenestrations. This shows you the nerves, the blue, bluish light. You can see his other, is the nerves highlighted here. And uh, as you see in the, on, on this electron micrograph, most of these are unmyelinated nerves. You can see the, the axon with the neurofibrils, with mitochondria, but no myelin. And this is a single Schwann cell that is surrounding several unmyelinated axons. That's a typical pattern in unmyelinated fibers. Uh, so, arteriole, a venule, and this a venule, and this is a rare uh, appearance of a lymphatic capillary. Well, lymphatic capillaries are um, present in most, uh, most organs of the human body. That's where the uh, lymph is filtered across the wall of the lymphatic capillaries from the tissue fluid, which is the fluid that surrounds the, the, the cells, that the cells are bathing in. Uh, the uh, lymphatic capillaries are lined with lymphatic endothelium, which is which is somehow different molecular characteristics from the, from the endothelium lining blood vessels, but the function is similar. Lymphatic vessels are much more permeable even to large molecules. So for example, the lymphatic capillaries in the, in the villi of human intestines, they, they, they are capable to, to, to take uh, the, uh, the uh, lipid uh, particles in yeah, large molecules. But you, do, you don't usually see the lymph capillaries in our routine sections. That's because after death, the first thing they do is that they collapse. There's no pressure inside anymore. So once you remove these tissue samples, they collapse and they stay collapsed. So unless you experience observers, you don't see lymphatic capillaries in routine section. That's why I wanted to show this. Uh, and if you compare, this is the endothelium of a, of a lymphatic capillary, very thin with large fenestrations, large gaps. And this is endothelium of the accompanying blood capillary. So these are different types of endothelium. And again, uh, 
I just wanted to show you some special capillaries like the capillaries of the lungs. Uh, this is the blood in the in a capillary running through the uh, through the interalveolar septum in the lungs, and this is the air in the lung alveoli. So we definitely need the continuous type of capillaries here because otherwise the the blood plasma would escape into the lung alveoli and we would literally drown in our own uh, tissue fluid. Uh, that's something we definitely don't want to. So we have this continuous type of endothelium, continuous basal lamina, and type 1 pneumocytes, which are flat cells. So that's the blood air barrier. Now, uh, the vessels of the human body, as you can see on this corrosion cast preparation, have an overall length that is amazing. It's, it's, um, it's estimated like it could be more than 100,000 of kilometers. So that's two and a half times around the globe equator. That's in every human body. The total length of all the vessels, including the capillaries. You don't see the microcirculation here, yeah? Um, and uh, this is just to point you out that uh, it, this visualizes the, the vasa vasorum of the coronary arteries, for example, and this is from a uh, micro CT, from computer, computer tomography with high resolution, where the contrast has been injected into the blood. So what you see here, it's actually the lumen of the coronary arteries and their branches, which are the vasa vasorum. So I want you to see how dense network of vasa vasorum provides the blood supply for the maternal vessel. Yeah, because the the the, the nutrition of of the arterial wall doesn't come from inside for the lumen. Uh, because the diffusion would not be efficient to to feed the whole thickness of the uh, of the arterial wall, but it comes from outside from the vasa vasorum, as you can see definitely on this on this preparation. Everybody should be aware of or be, to describe uh, be able to describe the microcirculation, including the sphincters on the met arterioles and precapillaries and uh, the three types of uh, capillaries with a different, with increasing permeability in, from, from left to right, as we already explained in our previous schemes. So this is just a recapitulation. How do blood vessels originate? We'll discuss it in detail in second year in embryology, but for the, as a first piece of information, there are two mechanisms. Um, uh, vasculogenesis versus angiogenesis. It's not the same. Vasculogenesis is a term reserved for a process where new blood vessels originate without uh, a previously existing uh, uh, vascular network. This occurs mainly in during embryogenesis where meso mesoderm or mesenchymal cells differentiate into endothelial cells and it uh, results in formation of these tubes that connect in networks, and that's how the first circulation is established. It occurs also in some tumors, right? But the prevailing mechanism, as we understand it currently, is the angiogenesis, which means either sprouting of the pre-existing pre uh, uh, blood vessels, or a non-sprouting angiogenesis, which is like division and separating and splitting of the pre-existing blood vessels. So the endothelium here divides branches into the periphery, forming new capillary loops, new blood vessels that are growing. And this is uh, regulated by many growth factors and the most famous being this VEGF, which says for vascular endothelial growth factor that binds to some receptors, VEGF receptors of various types, therefore stimulating the angiogenesis and vasculogenesis as well. I'm mentioning this because um, um, in oncology and in pharmacology later on, you will go back to that topic and you will discuss 
how this uh, can be used in some tumors to, to reduce the tendency to form new blood vessels. It's not working in most tumors, but it's used, the, the therapy against these growth factors is used, for example, in, in a colorectal cancer, right? In some types of the colorectal cancer to, to prevent the excessive formation of blood vessels. Unfortunately, tumor tissue is pretty good in angiogenesis because the hypoxia is a strongly stimulating factor to, 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 to promote the growth of new blood vessels. Okay, um, a few interesting things you will hear about later on in your studies, but I believe they are linked to our topic. It's the atherosclerosis. Unfortunately, the complication of this process is responsible for more than 50% of death, of deaths in industrial countries uh, nowadays. So it's a, it's a major, major problem in medicine. And it starts here with, the, with affecting the proper function of endothelium and with the thickening of the subendothelial connective tissue, which normally is pretty thin. But once uh, lipid molecules become trapped inside, and especially if they are modified um, by non-enzymatic uh, glycosylation, uh, uh, like during diabetes, uh, they become trapped there. The macrophages are are attracted to these uh, lipid molecules, and uh, they migrate in. They try to phagoc phagocytize these uh, lipid molecules. They produce more more uh, inflammatory factors, attracting more immune cells. So what starts here in this uh, subendothelial connective tissue, it's an inflammation process that, uh, that pr will progress and uh, the lipids will accumulate there in the, in, the, in, in, in the dead macrophages. You can see the lipid droplets here as the atherosclerosis uh, uh, progresses. And uh, if it takes years and decades, it develops into this atherosclerotic uh, lesion that usually has a central core. It's called atheroma, atheroma, covered by this uh, fibrous, fibrous um, uh, um, cap. And uh, this is already a very fragile structure that um, has the grows over years and decades, but when it ruptures, uh, it can, it can uh, uh, obliterate the, the blood vessel in seconds. And that could kill us if this would be a formation of a thrombus uh, in, in a coronary artery or in some, one of the brain arteries. That's really, really a dangerous thing. So you'll definitely hear about vascular wall, wall in pathology and in other subjects. So keep in mind the normal structure so you would understand what, what, what can go wrong there. If you have ever heard about cholesterol, for example, in the vascular wall, do you see these spiky crystals here? This is cholesterol in an atherosclerotic uh, lesion in, in, the, in the arteries. And now uh, I'll finish with some more real slides just to summarize and practice what we have learned. And this could be uh, some of the slides um, uh, uh, you will see, uh, you, you could have seen in our practical classes. Uh, and you should be able already to make a diagnosis now. So if you look at this, uh, you should see the intima here, the media, being the thickest, and the adventitia. Uh, you could be asked, is, is it a muscular or elastic artery? So in this staining, which is a combination of green trichrome, where collagen is green, and the special type of hematoxylin, where that stains the uh, elastin black, you can see the pattern of repeating black elastic membranes which is typical for elastic arteries. So your response would be, it's an elastic artery. Then you could be able to demonstrate some of the vasa vasorum here. These are the blood vessels in the adventitia, right? And the type one collagen as the green stuff here in, in the adventitia. So this is a muscular, muscular, uh, sorry, 
I'm sorry, elastic, elastic artery. This is aorta, by the way, of a young individual. We can, we can easily tell that because the intima is very thin. Unfortunately, as we age, the intima becomes thicker and thicker and thicker. Yeah. The atherosclerosis uh, starts in the first and second decade for life and progresses for years. Uh, again, this is the ha routine hematoxin el uh, elzin uh, uh, staining, so the, the, the most uh, routinely used. And this uh, hematoxin elzin does not stain the elastin. So you can still see the elastin, but rather like whitish and wavy membranes here. So again, you can see this repeating pattern of elastic membranes in the media of an artery. So it must be an elastic artery. This is, by the way, aorta again. Uh, the intima will be here with some damage. That's artificial. The media here and here will be the adventitia. So it's an elastic artery. It's aorta. If you need to see the elastin and prove it specifically and observe it, trust to, 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 to make sure the elastin is really here, you need to need some special stains. Like, like this is a staining called Orsain, uh, O-R-C-E-I-N, Orsain, that stains exclusively, or mostly, elastin. So you can, you can get an idea how, how dense network of elastin there is inside the, the aorta. Without elastin, the aorta would not be able to withstand these repeated cyclic loading during every, every systolic blood, blood pressure peak. So that's why we call these arteries elastic. Look at, look at elastin. Everything that is here brown, brownish, is elastin, right? And this is a detail from the Adventitia showing you the, some larger vasa vaso room, like this smaller vasa vaso room. Here, some black remnants of elastin in the, in the adventitia, the green collagen in the adventitia, type 1 collagen, and also the peripheral nerves. This is a nerve and this is a nerve. We can even tell these are un unmyelinated nerves, right? So these are nervi vasorum and these are the vasa vasorum. You might be asked to demonstrate this uh, during the slide exam. Okay, but that's, it's, it's actually very easy. Uh, from anatomy, you know that arteries are often accompanied by uh, two or three veins. This uh, situation occurs, uh, uh, for example, in, in upper and lower extremities. Uh, so this is a nice uh, picture showing the difference between an artery and one, two, three veins that are accompanying this artery. Uh, these vascular bu bundles, they often share the same adventitia layer. And as you can see on a, on a, on a close-up picture, this is an artery and this is the accompanying vein. They have the same adventitia. So the veins are of the same diameter or even of the larger diameter, but after death, they have the tendency to collapse because uh, their vascular wall do does not retain the, the original shape they used to have in vivo. So that's the difference between artery and a vein. Uh, this is an arteriole maintaining the shape more or less. And this is a vein. Now I'm sure the cursor points to, to a vein. How do I know? Because you can see the vein, uh, uh, vein valves. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. These are valves inside the veins. So you can have an impression how, how densely are the valves uh, um, arranged as chains. And this prevents the, the backwards flow of, of, of the blood, okay? Because the veins are opening in one direction and closing, uh, preventing the blood to, 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 to flow back. Uh, this is already a vein. It's, it's, uh, it's a, uh, a pretty muscular vein of the, it's, it's, it's a deep vein of the lower extremities. Uh, the, the, the reddish stuff here, it's a uh, smooth muscle, but can you see the, how thick here the, the adventitia is? 
and how the smooth muscle is uh, intermingling with the green collagen. So there's definitely much more collagen than in arteries. These are some nerves, right? And this is a pretty muscular vein. Unfortunately, it's collapsed. It's what veins do after death. death. This is a gr uh, great saphenous vein, you know, from, from anatomy, like the surface veins of the lower extremities. And again, you can have the impression how pretty muscular the vein, these veins are. Um, they need to this, this muscle tissue to maintain the tone uh, of of the of the venous wall as the flow as the blood flows against the gravity unfortunately these veins are sometimes uh, sometimes affected by formation of varicosities of dilations that will result in incompetency or in insufficiency of the of the valves because then the wall leaflets um, they have spaces in between, and they stop to work as as the one way wolves, and the the blood can remain there and, and can uh, lead to very uh, to to formation of uh, very causities of dilated dilated uh, segments. This is a comparison of an of a femoral artery and accompanying vein, they have the same adventitia, so can, you can clearly see the histological difference between an artery and a vein. This is the same, um, uh, but the artery is uh, down here, and the vein is down here. Uh, the elastin is stained brownish here. This is an artery, it's the tunica media of the artery, it's adventitia, and this is the vein. They share the same adventitia with the artery. Uh, this is the inferior vena cava. You can see the smooth muscle here. And the smooth muscle here runs uh, parallel to the long axis of the, of the vein. Here is a huge nerve in the, in the accompanying connective tissue. And this is the heart with the fat in the epic epicardium. This is one of the peripheral nerves in the epicardium. This is where myocardium, the cardiac muscle, begins. This is a detail of the epicardium fat with some branches of the coronary arteries. This is a huge coronary artery, is the ramus inter is the anterior interventricular ramus on the left coronary artery. And it's uh, surrounded by the fat here in the epicardium. But you can see that the thickening of the intima already has begun. Yeah, right? Here will be the media, and this is a thickened intima. So the process will take years, 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 closing slowly the lumen, but there will be a danger of the rupture, okay, that could cause an infarction of myocardium. And we already inside the Myocardium, uh, you can uh, you can uh, uh, see the 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 the, uh, the, uh, the cardiac muscle cells and the blood vessels providing the blood supply to the myocardium. It's pretty dense vascular network here inside. Even the small arter arterioles and capillaries is a very dense uh, vascular network supplying the the metabolic needs of myocardium. Uh, these are cardiac myocytes in a cross section, so you can see the central position of the nuclei here, okay, and the endomysium, the connective tissue here. It's a lot more longitudinal section through uh, cardiac muscle cells. This is a binucleate cardiac myocyte, you can see the two nuclei, but most of these have single nuclei in the center. These granules, these uh, yellowish to brownish granules on the pores of the nucle nuclei is the lipofuscin, it's the wear and tear pigment that's accumulating in the cells as we are aging. You can see the intercalated discs here where two cardiac myocytes are touching. And this is the same uh, specimen but with the trichrome staining uh, that gives you the green contrast of the collagen of the endomysium and the brownish uh, staining of the of the myofibrils and of the sarcoplasm of the cardiac muscle cells. Again, 
you can see the the intercalated discs here. And here is one of the capillaries. You can see the endothelial cells of the capillaries, right? Uh, this is part of the cardiac skeleton. So this is the dense collagenous connective tissue with some tendency to resemble fibrous cartilage. Uh, uh, it's not a proper cartilage like in some other mammals. Some other mammals, they have really fibrous cartilage or even bones in the heart. Humans don't, but it's a dense collagenous connective tissue in, uh, into which the myocardium is attaching. And it also helps to electrically isolate the myocardium of atria from the myocardium of ventricles. So the only electrical connection normally is the atrioventricular uh, bundle of his. Uh, because this is not uh, conducting, this tissue is not conducting electric impulses, unlike the myocardium. And it's also essential for insertion of the, of the rings of the heart uh, valves. And we already in the, my, in the, uh, on, on the border between myocardium on the left and endocardium on the right in the ventricles, and this is to demonstrate the difference between the working cardi myocardium, the, the regular myocardium here, and the Purkinje fibers here. So I believe you, you would agree that these Purkinje fibers have a large diameter and they stain less intensely because they have less myoglobin, less myofibrils, and more collagen when compared to the force generating myocardium because these Purkinje fibers are the terminal fibers of the cardiac conductive system and their task is to distribute the electric activity uh, all over the ventricles so the contraction would be synchronized in all compartments of the ventricles so the ventricle could really contract in an efficient manner to work as a pump so that's the that's the that's the task of this Purkinje fibers. Uh, it's another picture. Now the Purkinje fibers are on the left, okay? And the myoca normal myocardium is on the right. So you can see they are larger and uh, more palely stained. Uh, this is to illustrate some microvessels. Uh, if you remember, we mentioned the sinusoids as dilated, uh, uh, highly permeable capillaries. So this is liver. These are liver cells, and among the liver tubercules, we got these vascular spaces with the red blood cells and other blood, blood elements. These are the liver sinusoids, okay? Highly permeable, uh, dilated capillaries. These are also capillaries, but I took an example from the pulp cavity uh, of, of, of tooth. So this is a loose connective tissue uh, and it's highly perfused. You can see the capillaries even with the blood elements inside. This is also a capillary. This is also a capillary. This is also a capillary. And this is a capillary running right next to a nerve. This is one of the nerve, nerves of the pulp cavity. And um, this will be example of capillaries from the renal corpuscle, uh, from the cortex of kidney. You can see the red blood cells inside. And the, in this uh, case, the capillaries are forming a, a, a tuft, a glomerulus, many loops of capillaries together, being surrounded by the internal layer of the Bauman's capsule that are cells called podocytes, epithelial cells that are embracing the epithelial, sorry, embracing the capillaries with their processes. And among the branches of these finger-like processes, they have the filtration slits through which the blood plasma is filtered into this urinary space from, um, uh, that takes it to, to primary uh, kidney tubules. This is also a picture uh, showing the renal cortex, the cortex of a kidney. And just to give you an impression how dense the network of the blood vessels is in the kidney. Do you remember uh, that the kidney took one-fifth of the cardiac output? Yeah, one liter per minute in an adult. So look how is the dense capillary network surrounding the tubules of the, of the kidney cortex in this case. So this all are capillaries of the kidney. Kidney is 
amazingly highly perfused organ. And this is from the medulla of the kidney. These are the papillary ducts that uh, collect, that uh, take the urine to the, uh, to the uh, tips of the renal pyramids, uh, where the urine is dropping into the minor calyces of the kidney. But I am showing this to, 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 to demonstrate the difference between a capillary here with the endothelium cell and the red blood cells, and this structure, which is not a capillary, but uh, it's lined with simple squamous epithelium, and it's the thin segment of the loop of Henle. If you remember the loop of Henle in the in the in the in the renal uh, medulla, that's it. The endothelial nucleus is much more here bulging inside the lumen of a capillary. But otherwise, these are all similar structures. Yeah? Again, capillaries of the renal medulla. And my last picture is from the brain. You can tell it because you can see the triangular shape of the pyramidal neurons here from the brain cortex, either from the third or from the fifth layer. We don't see the, the context. Uh, but if you remember, uh, we, we have told that it's, uh, this is, are the uh, continuous type of capillaries. They have a continuous basal lamina. And the brown structure that is, looks brown here, it's a specific detection of laminin, which is one of the glycoproteins uh, of the basal lamina. So you really can see a nice circle around every capillary. And you can get the impression how the dense, the capillary network in our brain cortex is. All the brown structures are cap brain capillaries of the human brain. So if you need to uh, understand what uh, to remember, what will be the questions in the exam, again, go to uh, the goals and outcomes on a website. And this is for this chapter, uh, the cardiovascular system. It's already part of the um, I would say organ histology, the systematic histology, but as the blood vessels are literally in every slide, we, we expect also the first year students to know that. You will go into details of organ histology in the second year, but this still uh, will be part of our uh, exams. It's, it's part of the syllabus. So you don't need to ask what they will be asking. It's all here published. Uh, publicly. So thank you for working together and the last lecture will be delivered next week uh, in the same time uh, and it will be again a window into the organ histology uh, of, of the lymphoid organs such as uh, thymus, uh, spleen, uh, lymph nodes, uh, 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 mucosal lymphoid tissue, and uh, also endocrine glands, such as the pituitary gland, uh, thyroid gland, um, uh, adrenal gland, endocrine portion of pancreas, and so on. Uh, so thank you for working together. I'm stopping the recording now. Goodbye, and I will just answer some of the, some of the questions I see in the chat.